Deep in the Sudanese desert, towering mountains of black slag stretch toward the horizon, remnants of the most sophisticated iron industry the ancient world had ever seen. These aren't natural formations. They're the industrial waste of a civilization that was smelting iron on a massive scale, while much of Europe was still struggling with bronze. Most people assume that advanced metallurgy developed gradually from simple beginnings, spreading slowly from one civilization to another. The conventional story tells us that iron technology moved from the Middle East through Egypt and eventually reached Sub-Saharan Africa. But what if that story is completely backward? What if Africa was leading the world in iron technology while other civilizations were still catching up? The Kingdom of Kush, centered in the city of Mero, operated what can only be described as the ancient world's first industrial iron complex. Archaeological evidence shows that iron production was practiced in the Mero area for more than 1,000 years, potentially starting as early as the 25th dynasty period. Dogon people. Wikipedia in this video, I'm going to show you how this African kingdom created metallurgical innovations that wouldn't be matched anywhere else in the world for centuries. Before we dive into this remarkable story, I'd love to hear from you. Drop a comment and tell me where you're watching from and how the weather is treating you today. The scale of iron production at Mero defies everything we know about ancient manufacturing capabilities. The importance of ironworking at Mero was suggested by the numerous slag heaps that surrounded the city on its north and east sides. When archaeologists first mapped these slag piles in the early 20th century, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. Some of these waste heaps tower over 20 feet high and stretch for hundreds of meters. Think about what that represents. To create slag piles of that magnitude, you need continuous, large-scale production over centuries. You need sophisticated furnace technology, organized labor systems, and access to massive quantities of raw materials. The location also afforded access to trade routes to the Red Sea. The Kush traded iron products with the Romans, in addition to gold, ivory, and slaves. The Butana Plain was stripped of its forests, leaving behind slag piles. Here's what makes this absolutely extraordinary. Potentially from as early as the 7th century BC to as late as the 6th century AD, a significant quantity of iron was produced at Mero. Dogon tribes advanced astronomical knowledge, serious bee mystery that's over a thousand years of continuous iron production at industrial levels. For comparison, Europe wouldn't see comparable industrial iron production until the late medieval period, more than a thousand years later. But the mystery deepens when we examine the technology itself. Recent archaeological investigations have revealed furnace designs and smelting techniques that were incredibly advanced for their time. The focus of this study are the technical ceramics, including tuyeres, furnace linings, and furnace bricks. Dogon restudied a field evaluation of the work of Marcel Griol and comments and replies, current anthropology, volume 32, number 2, specialized equipment that shows sophisticated understanding of metallurgical processes. What topic in African history baffles you most? Share it in the comments below, and I'll research it for our next deep dive together. The Kushite metallurgists weren't just producing iron, they were engineering it. Archaeological evidence shows they understood how to control carbon content to create different grades of steel, from soft wrought iron for agricultural tools to hard steel for weapons and cutting implements. This level of metallurgical sophistication wouldn't become common in European ironworking until the Renaissance. Iron provided its farmers and hunters with superior tools and weapons. The development and use of iron was thus partly responsible for the very success, growth, and wealth of Meroe. The Dogon and Molian uses of Gryolian ethnology, politica, but this wasn't just about making better tools for local use. The Kushite iron industry was export-oriented, supplying iron products throughout the region and beyond. Here's where the story becomes even more remarkable. A spelter moved the capital to Meroe, considerably farther south than Napata, possibly c. 591 BC, 
just after the sack of Napata by Samtik II. Martin Meredith states the Kushite rulers chose Meroe, between the 5th and 6th cataracts, because it was on the fringe of the summer rainfall belt, and the area was rich in iron ore and hardwood for iron working. This wasn't an accident of geography, it was strategic industrial planning. The Kushite rulers recognized that controlling iron production would give them economic and military dominance over the entire region. They deliberately established their capital in a location that would maximize their metallurgical advantages. The environmental impact of this ancient industrial complex is still visible today. Vast areas of the Sudanese landscape bear the scars of intensive iron production. Deforested regions where hardwood was harvested for charcoal, mining pits where iron ore was extracted, and those massive slag heaps that continue to dominate the horizon. Recent experimental archaeology has attempted to recreate Kushite smelting techniques using traditional methods and materials. Since 2012, intensive archaeometallurgical research has been conducted at the royal city of Mero, a site famed for its impressive ancient metallurgical remains. Haunting Griol, experiences from the restudy of the Dogon, scholarly publications, the results have been stunning. Researchers discovered that Kushite furnaces achieved temperatures and efficiency levels that rival modern industrial processes. But here's what makes this discovery truly mind-blowing. The Kushite iron industry predates comparable European developments by centuries. While Rome was importing iron from various sources and struggling with quality control, Kush was operating integrated mining, smelting, and manufacturing operations that produced standardized, high-quality iron products at an industrial scale. If this story is touching your spirit the way it's touching mine, please hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications. Your subscription means the world to me, as this channel is still young and growing, and every subscriber helps us preserve these powerful stories that deserve to be remembered. The sophistication of Kushite metallurgy extended beyond just iron production. The discovery of two smithing areas, refining and smithing iron, emphasizes the importance of smithing in the town and shows that a large part of the inhabitants of Muways may have been involved in the smelting and smithing activities. Marcel Griol, Wikipedia this reveals an entire economy built around metal production. Specialized workers, organized production systems, and integrated supply chains. Archaeological evidence shows that different areas of marrow specialized in different aspects of iron production. Some neighborhoods focused on or preparation and initial smelting. Others specialized in secondary processing and tool manufacturing. Still others were dedicated to creating the specialized ceramics needed for furnace construction and maintenance. This level of industrial organization required sophisticated planning and management systems. Someone had to coordinate the harvesting of wood for charcoal, the mining and transportation of iron ore, the production of ceramic components, and the scheduling of smelting operations. The Kingdom of Kush had developed what amounts to ancient industrial management. The quality of Kushite iron products was so renowned that they became trade goods sought throughout the ancient world. Roman merchants specifically requested iron from Mero, recognizing its superior quality. This wasn't just raw iron, Kushite smiths were producing finished goods, agricultural implements, weapons, household items, and specialized tools that were exported across Africa and into the Mediterranean world. But perhaps most remarkably, the Kushite iron industry appears to have developed independently of outside influence. It was only during the Sate period, 665 to 525 BC, that iron smelting became evident in Egypt. Iron came into general use in Egypt later, that is, by the 5th century BC. The Dogon and the Sirius star this means that Kushite iron technology predated Egyptian adoption of ironworking completely reversing the conventional narrative of technological diffusion from north to south. The implications of this chronology are staggering. It suggests that Sub-Saharan Africa wasn't receiving iron technology from the Mediterranean world. It was developing and potentially exporting it. The traditional story of technological progress moving from advanced, 
civilizations to primitive ones collapses when we examine the archaeological record objectively. Recent chemical analysis of slag samples from Marrow has revealed another stunning aspect of Kushite metallurgy. The composition shows that Kushite smelters understood how to manipulate furnace atmospheres to control the chemical reactions involved in iron production. This is sophisticated chemistry that requires deep understanding of metallurgical processes. The furnace designs found at Marrow show innovations that wouldn't appear in European ironworking for centuries. Kushite metallurgists develop techniques for maintaining consistent temperatures, managing airflow, and separating iron from slag that represent genuine technological breakthroughs. The remains of extensive iron industries form prominent features at key locations within the Meroitic landscape, demonstrating the significance of iron production within the history of this period of the Kingdom of Kush. Griol's legacy, rethinking La Parole Claire in Dogon studies. This wasn't just one site, it was a regional industrial network connecting multiple production centers. What part of Marrow's industrial achievement intrigues you most? Is it the massive scale of production that created those towering slag heaps? The advanced furnace technology that achieved industrial level efficiency? Or perhaps the way an entire civilization organized itself around metallurgical innovation? Share your thoughts in the comments. I love hearing which aspects of these remarkable stories capture your imagination. The social implications of this industrial revolution are equally fascinating. Iron production at Marrow wasn't controlled by a small elite. Archaeological evidence suggests that ironworking was integrated into daily life throughout Kushite society. Neighborhoods had their own smithing areas. Families passed down metallurgical knowledge through generations, and iron production became part of the cultural identity of the kingdom. This democratization of advanced technology is remarkable for the ancient world. In most civilizations, sophisticated crafts were monopolized by specialized guilds or controlled by ruling classes. But in Kush, iron production appears to have been a community enterprise that involved large segments of the population. The decline of Marrow's iron industry around the 6th century AD marks the end of one of humanity's most impressive early industrial achievements. Climate change, deforestation from centuries of intensive production, and shifting trade routes eventually made the massive iron operations unsustainable. But the legacy remains embedded in those towering slag heaps that still dominate the landscape. Every ton of metallic waste represents thousands of hours of skilled labor, sophisticated planning, and technological innovation. These aren't just archaeological curiosities. They're monuments to human ingenuity and industrial capability that developed in Africa centuries before similar achievements elsewhere. Modern metallurgists studying the Kushite remains have identified techniques and innovations that they describe as ahead of their time. Chemical analysis reveals alloy compositions and heat treatment methods that demonstrate sophisticated understanding of material science. Furnace designs show innovations in thermal management that represent genuine engineering breakthroughs. The story of Marrow challenges fundamental assumptions about technological development and cultural diffusion. It demonstrates that innovation doesn't follow predictable patterns from advanced to primitive civilizations. Instead, it emerges wherever human creativity and necessity combine with available resources and cultural support for experimentation. As we wrap up this exploration of ancient Africa's industrial revolution, we're left with profound questions about how we understand technological progress. The iron pillars and slag mountains of Marrow stand as testimony to human capabilities that transcend conventional historical narratives. The Kingdom of Kush created an industrial complex that operated at levels not seen elsewhere in the ancient world. Their metallurgical achievements represent one of humanity's early triumphs in large-scale manufacturing, technological innovation, and industrial organization. These weren't primitive experiments with iron. They were sophisticated industrial operations that supplied high-quality metal products throughout the ancient world. 
The towering slag heaps that still dominate the Sudanese landscape are more than archaeological remains. They're monuments to a civilization that understood the transformative power of technology and had the vision, skill, and organizational capability to harness it on an unprecedented scale. In rediscovering and celebrating these achievements, we don't just honor the memory of ancient Kushite metallurgists. We expand our understanding of human potential and remind ourselves that innovation and excellence have always been universal human qualities, manifesting wherever circumstances allowed genius to flourish.